Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 18th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, part one of a two-part series on basic home brewing equipment. We've covered some very advanced topics on this show over the past 44 episodes. And this week, we're going to step back a bit and take a good look at the foundation of good home brewing, the gear. We'll talk to Andy Sparks of the Home Brewery in Fayetteville, Arkansas today about what is absolutely necessary to get on the road to great beer. Well, first, a quick look in the mailbag. We've got one more update from Kevin, the brewer who was asking advice on how to make a mead-like beverage from maple syrup. Kevin says, after researching online and talking with my local homebrew store, uh, which just so happens to be run by the authors of Clone Brews, and uh, that's a Mark and Tess Samatulski, if you haven't been listening lately, I'm, uh, Kevin says, I'm going to dive into this maple mead slash wine experiment. I purchased two one-gallon jugs and some dry lavalin wine yeast. I'm going to use one quart of maple syrup with just under one gallon of water and cross my fingers. <laughs> I'm going to try and get a gravity of near 1,100 at the start. That's 1.100 1. specific gravity. Uh, Kevin says, I should be brewing this sometime next week and we'll try to take pictures of the process. Wish me luck. I'll keep you updated. Well, good luck, Kevin. Definitely. Uh, keep us posted, and I look forward to further updates on how that uh, maple brew comes out. And uh, I'd love to see how that looks. It's probably going to be a, a, a pretty uh, brew. Chris in Maryland writes in with a tip. He says, I appreciate all the tips you and your listeners give out. Here's one of mine. When bottling homebrew, I always use one clear glass bottle so I can see more clearly how bottle conditioning is going. It's a good way to clearly observe visible contaminants as well as see how the beer is clearing up. A long neck Corona bottle does the job well. Well, that's a great idea. I've, I've, I've cleaned out my bottle collection and I've gotten rid of all but my brown bottles, but it would be good to have a handful of clear ones just for this purpose. Uh, you know, brown bottles are sort of like sunscreen for beer. They keep out the harmful light that can uh, interact with the compounds from the hops to cause skunking or that skunking off flavor. However, uh, one clear bottle in each batch would serve as a good kind of window into how your beer is doing as far as the color and the clarity and uh, whether it's got any sort of, uh, as Chris says, visible contaminants. Hopefully you don't have any of those. Uh, you know, in reality, if you can be guaranteed that your bottled beer will stay in a dark basement or closet for its whole life, you can safely use any color of glass. But uh, me personally, I want to take that extra step in using brown bottles to make sure none of my precious brew uh, gets skunky. But, you know, I actually know someone who who drinks one of the European beers in the green bottles and he says he loves driving past a dead skunk on the highway because the smell reminds him of his favorite beer. <laughs> That's a true story. I guess it takes all kinds. And I guess, you know, if you enjoy skunky beer, more power to you, I guess. Now, for those of you with high-speed Internet connections, I want to let you know that the latest episode of Basic Brewing Video is out there now. In this week's episode, I brew up the American Brown Ale recipe from Jeff Bearer's multi-brew experiment. You know, Jeff produces craft beer radio, and he ran an experiment a while back where home brewers from across the country sent in their batches of the same recipe for this American Brown Ale. Then Jeff and Greg and, and others, including Rick Sellers from Pacific Brew News Radio, got together over a Skype connection in one of their episodes to taste and compare the different batches. Now, I fully intended to take part in the experiment. I even bought my ingredients in time, but uh, as, you know, those who own their own businesses out there, you know, I, it often happens. I got really busy, uh, and when I wasn't busy, the weather was lousy, uh, and before you knew it, it was too late. So, I used the ingredients that I had in this week's video podcast, so maybe that will make up for my my uh, dropping out of the multi-brew experiment. Uh, Steve Wilkes cooked up a delicious gumbo yaya to go along with it, 
and he used two bottles of the brown ale in the gumbo. And even if you don't have broadband, you can go to basicbrewingvideo.com to check out and download uh, the recipe. And there's a link to uh, the Craft Beer Radio site for the recipe of the brown ale. And as a reminder, by the way, if you don't have a video iPod to see the video, uh, you don't need one. You don't need a video iPod to see the video, just a computer. Uh, and I, I know you've got one of those, or you wouldn't be listening to me now. I don't think. I don't think there's any other way. <laughs> uh, now, I've received several letters similar to this one from Paul in Houghton, Michigan. I hope I'm pronouncing his town correctly. Paul writes, I have not brewed beer or wine since I was in college uh, in 1987 to 1993. He's telling his age. In England, I now live in Michigan and want to get started again. Back in the old day, I used my dad's gear. How cool is that, that he's using his dad's gear to homebrew? So selecting enough but not too much gear in a kit is an issue. I may have missed it, but it would be great if you could review some hardware. Now, I've had other questions about brewing equipment and gear, um, so I thought I would ask Andy Sparks of the Home Brewery in Fayetteville, Arkansas, to join us to start from the beginning. Well, Andy Sparks, thanks for uh, having us back in your homebrew shop again. Well, James, I love having you here. You're a, a welcome guest and, and rather a celebrity when you come in here. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a legend by, in my own mind. Uh, <laughs> and then when I bring beer, too. That's that, always good, too. That helps. Here, James. Cheers. We're drinking a, a heavy Weizen that I made that uh, is one of those things where you can screw up and still make pretty good beer. This is certainly a very drinkable beer. It would be a great beer during the summer. Uh, and I actually caught a little of that uh, little banana mm -hmm. on the last time I took a quaff, which I didn't pick up at first. Maybe it's just warming up a little bit. Yeah, and you, you were complaining about it not being warm, not being cold enough. Yeah, well, but, you know, I think it's it, it's better uh, a little bit warmer. What I did was I, I got a new brew pot, and uh, I wasn't used to the volume levels on it, so I accidentally made six gallons instead oh. of five gallons. So. Well, that would explain for the, the slight thinness of it. But, uh, again, that wouldn't hurt in a, uh, for a summer beer, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not exactly what I was looking for, but it's still darn good. And in the middle of, uh, if it makes it to June or July, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. it'll be pretty refreshing. Uh, but what I asked, to, asked to, to talk to you about is I've gotten some emails lately on equipment. And, it's, and uh, a couple saying... What are the basic tools that I need to get into this hobby? What's the basic stuff, you know, that I can get away with? What do I need and what's just handy to have to get into home brewing? And I thought that I made a little list. I see which that. I, which I'm not sharing with you. <laughs> and you couldn't read it even if quiz. you could see it. And I thought that I would compare my list with your list. And we'll see, you know, let, I, I want to start out with, what is necessary, what is not technically necessary but really handy to have to help, that helps you out. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and then I want to go a little bit into the third level of, you know, some cool toys. Fun that to are, have. Yeah, yeah that, that you don't technically need to have but are really cool to have. Well, I find that uh, a lot of the people that uh, enjoy this hobby tend to really enjoy those kind of gadgets. <laughs> so <laughs> even if we cover what the, what the very basics are, I, I have a feeling that all your listeners out there are all longing for the cool toys as well. So. Yeah, that's kind of like yeah. the, the old uh, uh, Tool Time TV show. The <laughs> refractometer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's the first thing on your list of uh, things... Pieces of equipment you got to have to make beer. Well, obviously, the I, I would think the very f first and most important thing you have to have is a fermenter, something to ferment in, something that can be thoroughly cleaned, can be sealed up, uh, with the exception of uh, a place for the uh, CO2 to escape. Um, and this is a big deal, you know. I mean, this is the most important thing is to it's to keep your beer safe while it's fermenting. Um, so that's where I would start. Okay. And, and we can go either 
either plastic or glass. You and can go plastic? <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, Mr. Homebrew <laughs> store owner. <laughs> no, you know, the truth is a lot of people start with plastic, um, but plastic has its some a, draw, a couple drawbacks to it. Um, but it has its advantages, too. It's very inexpensive. Uh, you know, we our very basic kit comes with a plastic fermenter. Um, but we encourage people to, to move to glass pretty much as soon as they can. Glass is just much more uh, resilient um, and easy to clean. Uh, the problem with plastic is that it, uh, it can be scratched. And what you find is that, that people, uh, after they've done maybe four, five, six batches of beer in a plastic fermenter, they're, the first few batches turn out great, and then they start to say, oh, you know, my first batches were good, but now I'm not doing so well. Um, and, I, and I'm really clean in my fermenter, and I don't know what's wrong. And I think the problem is the more they try to attack the cleaning problem in their fermenter, the more they scrub it and scratch it. Uh-huh. So they'll get out these little scrubby pads, and they really get in there and rub these things down. And those little, those little scouring pads uh, are actually have abrasive in them, and, and they scratch the, the plastic. And once you cause these micro-fine scratches in your plastic fermenter, um, you can get uh, bacteria will accumulate into those cracks, and you just can't get it out. Even soaking it uh, doesn't always get it out. Um, the other thing is that a lot of people will put a, uh, a spigot on their plastic fermenter. Those it makes it very handy at first, but uh, the spigot must always be completely taken apart and cleaned, and and even then it's hard to get inside it and get the little the little gunk out. And uh, so I'll have people that uh, you know start with a plastic fermenter with a spigot, and they have wonderful results the first two or three times, and then it starts to go downhill. So the way to get around that, and the the truth is most home brewers end up in this place anyway, is that they. They go to the glass fermenters, you know, because they're easy to clean. Well, I don't know, easy. Uh, but with a brush and, and some elbow grease, you can get them clean. Um, and, and you can't really scratch the inside of them because you can't get in there with something that can scratch glass, you know. So uh, I have the best luck with glass. And, and the other nice thing about glass is that it, it affords you the opportunity to watch the process take place. Mm-hmm. Um, both the primary fermentation... Uh, where you can see how really volatile the fermentation process is. Um, and then uh, after you go through your primary fermentation, if you use a glass secondary, uh, you can actually see when the beer has completely cleared. Uh, and you have a, you, you know, I tell a lot of people when they come in the store that th- this process is, is a living thing like a plant, and you really can't, you can't necessarily depend on when it will settle out or when it will finish its fermentation. It'll take its time and it'll do its own thing. And and if you have a glass secondary fermenter, you can actually see when it's cleared out and it's ready for the bottle bottling process. So <clears throat> now you said you said that uh, you thought glass was easier to clean than than plastic. I was going to say exactly the opposite. Hmm. I think the fact that if you get a, a five gallon food grade plastic bucket that you can take the lid off, you can reach your arm in there and scrub right. around with a cloth. Right. And you know really get out the stuff directly whereas i love my glass uh, right. primary fermenter you know still even with the brush it's it's tough to get it around does. some of the um, angles in there yeah and i what i do is i i'll soak my ferment fermenters uh overnight um to get the stuff because what will happen is that especially in your primary ferment fermenter um you'll get uh and what you'll want to do is you want to use a, a, a a glass carboy that's bigger than your batch size. You know, this is mm-hmm. a problem. We get a lot of people that'll come in here and say, well, I'm doing five-gallon batch. I just need one of those five-gallon fermenters or five-gallon <laughs> jugs. Well, you'll need a blow-off, too. Right. Too. <laughs> and uh, you need a good uh, gallon and a half worth of headspace for to, to for the croissant to kick up in there. Um, but what happens is that croissant kicks up in there and then falls back, and that stuff dries on the inside. Mm-hmm. So there's really no way to um, rinse it quickly and, and, and get it clean like a beer bottle, uh, you know, we we talked about that on one of your uh, last shows where you, you know, as long as you get your beer bottle after you use it, rinse the yeast out and get it, you know, rinsed out good uh, and let it dry, your bottle is basically clean and ready mm-hmm. to go. You, you'll you want to wash it, of course, before you use it and then and then uh, sanitize it. But unlike um, a fermenter, is different than that, you know, because it gets this dry film on it. It's almost impossible to 
not have it dry on the inside to some degree. But what I do is I will completely fill the thing with with uh, uh, warm water and uh, not hot water, but warm water, and then just let it sit overnight. And then mm. I can attack it with a brush, and that stuff tends to fall right off. Um, but uh, you're right. I mean, it is a little more difficult to clean, but I think it's more cleanable in that you know it, you're not getting the scratched areas inside where you can actually have stuff uh, stay. Mm. Uh, and you can see it. You can see through it, and you can see whether it's clean. So, well, that, that's a good point. <clears throat> now, uh, you can also get things like uh, uh, products like powdered brewery wash, and and uh, I've even used on occasion. And I'll probably get people screaming mm-hmm. at their iPods. <laughs> uh, I've even used a bit of uh, powdered uh, automatic dishwashing soap yeah. and in, the tr- in the carboy. Yeah, and, and I've done it that. Around I've done that too. Um, the truth is, one of the chemicals that's in most dishwashing detergents is one of the chemicals that's used um, to clean carboys if you buy it in homebrew shops. Uh, there's a chemical called trisodium phosphate, and I mm. think that's an active ingredient in lots of uh, dishwashing detergents. And it has a very uh, powerful uh, oh, uh, chemical uh, in it that, that makes it, uh, that breaks down that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, it makes the water feel very slimy, uh, mm-hmm. just like uh, Clorox, but it's not Clorox. It's a different product. But, yeah, I've done that, too, and that'll work good. But remember, always uh, rinse, wash rinse, it. Rinse. Yeah, you know, if I did it with, if I would put something like that in my carboy, I would let it soak, then I would uh, scrub it out, and then I would scrub it with soap and water, and then I would rinse it. So mm. I'm going to try and really make sure that none of those powerful chemicals are left. You know, by just doing a nice soap and water uh, wash, and then a thorough, thorough rinsing. You uh, you want to make sure it's completely rinsed out. You know, uh, because the last thing you want to do is have some soap in your in your beer chemicals yeah. like that. Yeah, it's bad bad for the taste and bad for head retention and just probably yeah, bad for bad you. Bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, cool. Well, we um, the first item on on my uh, oh well. Also, we might want to say uh, that. If you get a glass fermenter, it's going to be quite a bit heavier True. than the plastic. So if you've got back problems, True. that's going to be uh, a factor. Yeah, and uh, there's we've had a couple of customers that have dropped full carboys um, and broken them, and one of them uh, cut himself on it, uh, not terribly badly, but enough to give him a, a little scare. Um, and it just, and the fact is, you're, you, a lot of times when you're handling a carboy or when you're working with a carboy, it's when you've been working with water and washing your hands and cleaning up and, so and it's cool. easy to, you know, go over and grab it and then find out there's a little wet spot on one side or your hand's wetter than you thought and it's, it's very slippery. So, um, when you're dealing with a, with a, a full carboy, um, actually I, I really prefer not to have to lift, um, or move full carboys. Um, because they they can be dangerous. We do have a, a something that we do sell here, and I, I think lots of homebrew shops around the country sell a something called the brew hauler, um, and it's a nice little strap uh, situation that allows you to uh, put the strap on your carboy, and it gives you two nice handles on either side, and and I think would help as far as uh, you know lifting because you can lift with your your legs instead of your back. Um, we still carry the little uh, clamp on carboy handles. But the truth is, those were never really intended to lift a full carboy with. Mm. Those are meant to uh, allow you um, some maneuverability and some ha- ease in handling of a carboy when you're washing and cleaning it by putting this, clamping this handle around its neck, and now, therefore you can grab hold of this handle. Uh, yeah, but we advise not to use those handles for lifting uh, carboys and only to use them for uh, handling the carboy when you wash it and, and clean it and so forth. So... So if you have back problems, you might want to get a strap-on uh, <laughs> carboy carboy handle yeah. hauler thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Now we spent way way more time than I thought we would on just the one item, and I got a long list. Uh, you, the first thing on my list was a brew pot. Ah. <laughs> I guess they, so. There's two things you must have. <laughs> I bet we'll find more on this list. Uh, that is true. You know, uh, a lot of people. Uh, and, and then the reason probably I didn't put that at the top of my list is because a lot of people do have a pot that they plan to use as their brew pot, and it's not necessarily the first item that people run out and buy. It's mm-hmm. something that after you do a few batches in a in a 
in an inadequately sized pot, uh, <laughs> you later decide that's a, a require, you know, something that you really need is a pot that's big enough to boil your full batch in. A lot of people start with smaller pots, do partial boils, and then and add back water. But uh, I think it really improves the process um, to be able to boil your entire volume. Now, the reason I put brew pot at the top of my list was not not necessarily to get a brew pot that will hold that will do a full mm. boil, but just to find a pot even in your house right. that would be appropriate an appropriate size. And you you want to at least boil half of the batch. If you're doing a five gallon batch, I would say get a find a pot in your house that will hold at least three gallons. Yeah, I'd say at least three gallons. You know, you really want the biggest pot you can you can find. But you want to get a pot that is good and clean and can be cleaned easily. Um, I prefer not to use a pot that's ever really been used for boil for uh, cooking meats mm. that have lots of oils in them, because that stuff's very hard to get off. Um, but what I tell people, you know, because I, I have customers that that say, "Well, I have a pot, and you know, we use it for stew and this sort of stuff, but we're going to use it for this." And I say, "What you need to do is you need to probably boil a." Is fill it with water, bring it to a rolling boil for 15, 20 minutes, and then dump it out, and then maybe do that again, and make sure that after the water cools, that you don't see any sheen on the top mm. of the water, like a little oil slick, you know, because it doesn't take but just a teeny, teeny bit of oil um, stuck in a rivet somewhere that will, it'll ruin your beer, it'll make, it'll, it'll completely ruin the head retention, and uh, yeah, it'll just, it's not worth taking that chance, so... And there's been discussion on, on past episodes on stainless steel, enamel, aluminum. Well, you know, when I first got into the hobby many, many moons ago... <laughs> uh, you used stone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, was, it was commonly reported that, uh, or at least it was the understanding of most people in the business that it was not a good idea to use aluminum pots because the acidity of the wort uh, will leach the ions out of the the aluminum and give you Alzheimer's and all this other stuff. Or a metal taste. Or, or metallic tastes. And then I've read recently, um, I think there was an article in Brew Your Own, um, where they basically debunked that myth and they said that, you know, the truth is after the first couple times you use it, it aluminum develops an oxidizing film across it and it, it wouldn't be able to leach through that and... So uh, I don't use aluminum. I, I have a nice stainless pot, so that's what mm -hmm. I use. Um, I started out with an enamelware pot. Um, they work just fine. The problem with those is they eventually will get chipped, um, mm -hmm. or if they get bent or bumped, um, they, you can actually pop the enamel off of it, and then you expose uh, the just mild steel, I guess, and, and that will rust. And you, you, I actually have some that have rust marks on the inside of them. And that certainly would not be good for your beer. Mm. But if you're just starting out uh, and you just want to try home brewing, that's what if, I started with. If it you've got a decent pot. sized pot in your house, mm -hmm. it probably matters less at that point what it's made of. Right, right. Even if it was aluminum, do a couple batches with it, and if you decide you really love this hobby like we do, invest in a in a nice brew pot. It's uh they they are nice when you get a nice big brew pot. It's it's really nice to be able to bring the entire volume to a boil and stand over it and smell all those delicious mm. smells and yeah, it's and a it, wonderful thing. And I recently bought an aluminum a big aluminum uh, brew pot at a restaurant supply store. So yeah. and it works real well. Oh. This beer that you're drinking came, came from the aluminum pot. I don't taste any aluminum in it. <laughs> Uh, do you want to go next, or do you want me to go next? You know, the, the next item on the list of essentials. Hmm. I'm trying to You're read what you got there. With, <laughs> there's good luck with reading my uh, handwriting. Well, the next thing I'd probably pick would be a, a thermometer. Mm -hmm. um, thermometer is very handy uh, in the brewing process, uh, especially if you're doing starting out like most people do, doing kits and doing uh, extract batches, because... Uh, most kits call for some sort of grain addition, um, which would be a steeping kind of thing where, we, where you uh, put the grains in, the specialty grains in, and, and uh, kind of teabag them uh, and for, uh, until it gets up to 170 degrees. You don't want to exceed that because 
as I, as, as I have heard on your show before, <laughs> it uh, leaches the, the tannins out of the husks and, and, and produces the dreaded off flavors. 170 is the magic number. Um, yeah, and the floating thermometer, it comes in handy in, you know, on the other side of the boil when you're, when you're cooling down to pitching temperature. Yeah. You know, if you're if you make a starter, you're gonna you're gonna need to uh, you know check the temperature frequently on that since it's a, such a small volume. Uh, floating thermometers just you gotta have it. Right, and that's that's this part of the list. Yeah, and a couple a couple pointers about the floating thermometers. One, um, along with hydrometers, is they are suicidal. They <laughs> they like to jump off of counters and. <laughs> one, of, one of the things I'm buying today from you is a floating thermometer. I hope you got some floating thermometers in stock. We have, we have a couple. <laughs> uh, it it kind of broke my heart because that was, you know, I started, that's the th- floating thermometer that came with my original kit oh, 10 wow. years ago. Wow. So. Um, the other the other thing I'd point out, and this is, uh, I can't tell you how many customers have come back to me to buy a second floating thermometer. Um, if you've seen one of these things, they're kind of bullet shaped. They're like a little torpedo. And what they do is they... Put their hand, pick it up, and then they drop it in their brew pot. And this thing <laughs> will dive to the bottom of your brew pot and, and break on the bottom of your brew pot. So you must mm. set them in there. You can't throw them in there. You can't drop them in there. They will dive right to the bottom of the pot and break. And then you got to throw so, it all away. Right, because you don't want to be uh, drinking on. something with glass in it. No. no. So uh, those are a couple things. Uh, also, um, a... And we could probably group these three things together, a racking cane, tubing, plastic tubing, and a bottling wand, especially if you're going to start out, you're probably not going to be kegging, so you need those three things. Right, right. Um, you know, we we call, uh, we when customers come in, we, we, we talk about racking beer, and this is a racking cane, this is what it's for, and they always look at me with a funny look. You know, because we sit, we call it racking, and everybody else in the world, you know, would call it siphoning you mm-hmm. know, or or transferring. Um, but uh, the racking cane is is something you pretty much can't do without. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the hose, you know, it's it's really just a rigid piece of hose. But the the thing that it gives you is the ability to direct uh, and and point down into the bottom of your carboy or your fermenter. Uh, the rubber vinyl hose will coil um, and you will not be able to point it into the bottom of your fermenter to get those last drops of beer out of the fermenter. Most racking canes come with a special cap that uh, that forces it to draw from above the cap, and and it basically it keeps it from having the from sucking the yeast right off the bottom of the the fermenter, which is what you would expect if it was just a tube, um, you know, that mm-hmm. you poked down into the bottom of your fermenter. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Those things too get broken quite a bit. Uh, yeah. You know, when you uh, a lot of times when people put the uh, vinyl hose, you, you attach it to the, the the hooked end of it. It's like a big uh, like a big candy cane, for uh, lack of a better way to describe it, um, or like a I don't know what how would you yeah, describe it's like, it? Well, it's like a cane. It has yeah, a crook at the end. Exactly. Of it. And uh, we've actually had some people that thought it went in the other way with the little <laughs> hook, and and uh, and broke it trying to jam it in their carboy that way. Um, but uh, what happens a lot is they'll they'll attach the vinyl tube to the end of it, and uh, you'll get done uh, you know, racking your beer um, through the racking cane and the vinyl tube, and then they can't get it back apart, and they just pull and tug, and they snap mm. their racking cane doing this. I've found that. Uh, uh, pushing it, uh, pushing it on just slightly, and then withdrawing it kind of gives it a little air bubble. There's a little mm. vacuum under there, and it won't let it come off. The other thing is, if you, you can't get it off after trying just a little bit, I would just cut it, cut the hose at the edge of the wrecking cane, and take a small knife and slit the little piece mm. that's left on there, and just discard it. You're better off doing away with a half inch of, of vinyl hose than breaking your wrecking cane and having to get another one, especially in a pinch when you're needing it. Or twisting, twisting would yeah. be good, and probably soaking it in hot water. Yeah. So another way, uh, but yeah, the the racking cane is really good for, like, if you do a whirlpool at the end of uh, cooling down your wort, mm-hmm. uh, being able to direct the end of that racking cane. I mean, start your firm, start your siphon in the middle of the, you know, the, on the side of your mm-hmm. brew kettle, up halfway up the the uh, volume of of wort. 
to keep it away from the tube. Mm -hmm. It just is an excellent tool for helping you to uh, get your beer as, as clear as possible and keep it as clear as possible all throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Being able to direct where that where the intake goes is, is essential. Right. And you did, you mentioned the bottling wand uh, as well. Um, that's a, just a small straight cane with usually a spring-loaded valve in the bottom of it. Um, if you're bottling beer, you pretty much need to have one of these. Uh, I know people that have done it with just a clamp um, on their hose. It, it just doesn't work well. Uh, the racking or the uh, bottling wand will allow you to uh, uh, push it into the bottom of the bottle, and when you depress it against the bottom of the bottle, that that spring collapses and it allows the beer to flow out of the tube. And then when it gets up into the neck, um, pretty close to the top, you go ahead and pull it out, and that stops the flow. And then when you pull the cane out, that little bit of uh, of volume that that cane displaces ends up leaving the beer at just about the perfect spot mm -hmm. um, for capping. A good headspace there. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's essential that you take that thing apart when you when it's time to clean it. Oh yeah. Because the little spring can the uh, valve as well. Harbor some stuff in there. Yeah. So and the 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 real trick to all that is as soon as you're done using it, clean it. Yeah. Clean it right then. Rinse that Don't stuff. put it off. <clears throat> um, and you'll be so much happier, um, you know, than finding that it has green stuff in it the, night, <laughs> the day you're getting ready to bottle. Um, and then you can try and clean it out, but you'll, it, it's not worth the worry. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, it, once it grows that stuff in there, it's really hard to get out. So, and then the, the you need about a six foot long, uh, length of, uh, plastic tubing, which you'll probably want to replace you know, every few batches yeah. just for safety's sake. It's just cheap, and it's hard to keep, you know, even if you keep it washed, it's hard to keep it to dry it all the way mm -hmm. before you store it, and anything that you store that's wet is is going to be likely to develop mold mm -hmm. or to be a good environment for mold to grow. So right. it's just a cheap thing. I tend, to, I tend to replace my tubing a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh <clears throat> just because of that very reason, you know, I'll, I will, uh, I'll go back to get the tubing and I'll look at it and it'll look hazy, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just decide, nah, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, if I was to get done, um, and have something turn out bad and that was the corner I cut, then, you know, what can you do except throw it away, you know, or live with a bad tasting beer? Um, so yeah, anytime, anytime, and that goes for pretty much about everything in the homebrew process. If I question it when I go to use it, I usually replace it or really go out of my way to double clean it or, you know, really take the time because that's the thing. You don't want when it's all over, uh, to know that, oh, that was that one corner I cut and that's what ruined it for me this time. So, uh, and the truth is, the people that make the best beer are the people that are the most uh, careful. An anal. Of, <laughs> anal is uh, one way to describe it, but just very attention to detail. Um, don't cut corners and very, very careful about uh, keeping everything sanitized. And something that leads to uh, sanitary conditions, we, we didn't talk with our fermenter about an airlock. We were talking about before oh, we started. Uh, true. Before we started, we said technically, you could ferment in an open bucket if you wanted to. You, you know, you don't have to have a sealed container for your fermenter and an airlock. But why would you want to take the chance uh, nowadays? You know, when you you you'll have twenty, thirty dollars invested in a, in a five gallon batch, <clears throat> and and all your time. Yeah, and. To, to let all that go to waste, you know, it's just not worth it. Um, a, a fermentation lock is very cheap. Um, some people call them bubble locks uh, or bubblers, uh, and it's basically just a one-way valve that uses a liquid, um, usually water. Some people use vodka or, or, uh, or some other uh, alcohol. Um, I, I typically just use, you know, clean water in mine. I've never had much problem with that. Um, but I know people that use vodka or use grain alcohol in it. Um, those tend to evaporate a little faster, and you have to be careful and get it filled back up. Um, the one thing that that will do for you is that if uh, occasionally uh, a fermenter, if it changes temperature abruptly, um, 
the temperature fluctuates, it can actually draw the airlock, especially before the fermentation gets kicked off. You can see that it'll draw the liquid down into the, the mm -hmm. airlock, and you can get some of that sucked back into the fermenter. So if you had water, technically, you know, you it could be contaminated by the bacteria in the air that lands in it. But uh, the vodka or the alcohol will uh, kill anything that, that gets in it. And then if it gets sucked back into the fermenter, you, you don't have any chance of contamination. But typically, I don't put the airlock on until it's at room temperature. Mm -hmm. And I throw a good, healthy p bunch of yeast at it. And the yeast kicks off. And, and you get a positive flow of, of, uh, of CO2 going out of the vessel. So having it sucked back in is usually not a problem. Um, so, but uh, the airlock cheap and uh, no point to do without it if, mm -hmm. when it's so cheap. And uh, if you're bottling, of course, you're going to need a capper. True. Um, <laughs> there's a couple uh, types of cappers in, the, in out there uh, in the market. There's a what they call a wing capper or a hand capper, um, and it's a couple little levers and you, you, you either have to have an assistant hold the bottle for you tightly while you uh, use this two-handed capper to cap the put the cap on with or you can get down on the floor and hold it with your knees and cap it I've done it that way before um, I, I've seen I've seen people do it just on the table yeah but it's a little nerve-wracking to me because <laughs> you one slip and you launch the bottle across the room because you're <laughs> you really have to push down pretty hard on this thing to get the cap thing to, to crimp and therefore, if you you know slip, you're gonna be you're pushing really hard mm -hmm. on a bottle, and you could send it across the room. Um, I prefer the bench capper. Um, it's the other kind of capper, and it's I think much easier to use. It's uh, can be clamped or mounted to a, a desk or a table, and uh, and they're usually adjustable for different size bottles. Uh, and they usually have a little magnet up inside them to grab hold of the cap, so that you can grab a clean cap. Uh, lift it up into the capper, and it'll hold the cap there while you put your bottle in into place, and then just pull a lever. And with one of those, one person can mm -hmm. easily bottle a uh, batch of beer um, in you know not too much time at all uh, if you have all your bottles ready and all your caps ready. That's what I've always had. Um, and then one one piece of equipment that we said uh, we were talking before the show. Or before the recording, we we said could could go either way, either a must need or a should have. Mm. And you don't really technically have to have a hydrometer to make beer. Not really. I mean, the truth is, they didn't have them in the old days. They managed to make beer for thousands of years before uh, anybody figured out how a hydrometer works. Um, hydrometer. Uh, gives you a reading of the uh, amount of sugar in solution, this, or what we call the specific gravity of your uh, wort. And uh, but the truth is, you know, if you're going to make a kit, or you're gonna, or you're going to make a batch of beer from scratch, uh, or you know, from a recipe that you found on the internet, you're going to get done. You're going to boil it all up, and if you have a hydrometer, at that point, you're going to take this reading, and you'll be able to write that number down, and that's your specific, you know, or original gravity. But if you don't write that down, it's not going to change the fact that you're, you're, you've got the beer you're going to have either way. It, it's still the same beer. Uh, and then you put the yeast in, and eventually it'll stop fermenting, and you bottle it, you prime it and bottle it, and then you drink it. And, you know, a hydrometer is, is they're nice to have, uh, and almost every homebrew kit comes with one. Ours does. Um you know, I like to use them mainly for record keeping. You won't be able to repeat a batch of beer if you don't take good records. Uh, and being able to know whether the what the starting gravity is on each batch, you could make the same batch of beer back to back and not come out with the same starting gravity. And it might be nice to know that you didn't hit your gravity before you throw the yeast in. You could augment uh, at that point. You, there are ways to add more uh, fermentables, uh, you know, boil up some more malt, that sort of thing, uh, to drive the, to get it where you want it. But uh, on the other hand, you know, I, it's just not something that you have to have. A lot of people uh, also like to know how much alcohol is in their beer. That's the other main reason for doing it is you take your original gravity and you take your terminal gravity, the, the gravity at the end of the batch, 
and by doing some mathematics, uh, actually, what I usually do is just look on the on the side of the hydrometer, and <laughs> and because it also has a, a mm-hmm. potential alcohol uh, scale on there, and subtract one number from the other, and you get an approximate alcohol percentage for your beer. Um, that's nice. You can say my beer's five percent, whatever. Most of the time, you don't really care. It's just about drinking it, enjoying it. If if you like the way it tastes, that's what it's all about. Now, I I I was in. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. This is like point counterpoint. I was in the camp uh, of saying that you really don't need a, a hydrometer to make beer. I and mean, you really don't need a hydrometer to make beer. But I've gotten many uh, emails from, from beginning brewers especially. You know, my, my beer has been fermenting for only two days and it stopped. Do I have a stuck fermentation? Well, I don't know. The only way that you can tell for sure if your beer has finished fermenting is to take a hydrometer reading at the beginning and a hydrometer reading at the end once the yeast stops and once you if you calculate your apparent attenuation and it's within the specs of the yeast then you can feel fairly safe that your beer has stopped fermenting i mean i've gotten letters from people who's uh, i guess you know they pitched a lot of yeast and they were in a warm place and they they had went through f- the full fermentation in one day, 24 hours, yeah. boom, it's gone. <laughs> and then they panic and say, my fermentation is stuck. Well, I don't know, take a gravity reading. Yeah. So if you don't have a hydrometer, then you're, that, that, that level of security is, is right. not there. Uh, you know, that's true. I mean, if you, and, and that's part of what, like I was saying, the record keeping, keeping good notes, uh, keeping track of what you're doing. Um, but I wouldn't say that you, you can't make your first couple batches without one, mm. you know. Uh, also, um, in my time, you know, doing this, almost always what it is, what happens is it finishes fermenting in a day and a half or two days. And most of the time, you throw some fresh yeast in there, it's going to eat most of that sugar, mm-hmm. you know. And if you give it a few days, a week, week and a half, you're pretty, you, most of the time it works. Um and unless so, you're doing a barley wine or something right. like that where it's got to go through a lot of gravity. You know, uh, what I tell people if they're worried about it, um, I'll say, you know, sanitize up a, a spoon, a long-handled spoon really well. Give, you know, rouse the yeast, stir it up a little bit from the bottom if you think it's... With, without aerating it. Right, exactly. Just you get the yeast off the bottom a little bit, stir it back up, maybe move it to a slightly warmer spot. And and that, you know, will usually fix most problems with stuck fermentations. But, you know, the truth is I just don't run into a lot of people that actually have real stuck fermentations. Mm-hmm. Most of the time what it is is they fermented it too warm and it went off in a day, day and a half, two days. Um, now, you, you've, you've also got to know how to read your hydrometer correctly. Yeah. Because if you measure, take a measurement of uh, hot wort, it is going to give you a bad reading because the hydrometer is calculated to a certain temperature. I think it's, what is it, 68 degrees? Mm -hmm. Look at the instructions that come with your hydrometer. But if you you take a reading of of a wort that is too warm, you will get a reading, it'll sink lower in there, so you'll get a reading that is less than what What is accurate. So that that could be, that's another, probably another... uh, point of panic with new home brewers is that they measure the gravity of their wort when it's too hot. Right. And they say, oh, no, I didn't get nearly the, you know, the gravity I was expecting. And then they call Andy. Right, <laughs> right. And then they'll ask me, what it, what should it be? And that's really hard to say because did you put five and a half gallons in? Did you start with five gallons of water? You know, it's it's tough because that little bit of water will make a bunch of difference in mm-hmm. your in your gravity reading. Uh, so it, it's really hard for me to be able to say, oh, you're going to hit the, this this number when you make this kit or this recipe. Um, even I don't hit the same number every time necessarily, you know. It's there are a lot uh, of variables in all Yeah, that. yeah. And that's part of what makes it fun is that it's not always the same. Um, uh, the uh, and the last little thing, and I just want to mention, is a, is a grain bag. And you can get those disposable or reusable. Sure enough. Uh, those are great. Uh, if you're going to do, uh, specialty grains, uh, it's pretty much a must have item, um, because the grains are kind of hard to get back out once you get them in there. 
So, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever done done a batch of beer that that uh, used specialty grains where I didn't mm-hmm. use some sort of uh, bag, whether it's uh, the big nylon re- reusable ones or the or the smaller. Uh, they're kind of made of a cheese clo- uh, cheesecloth like material, um, basically like a little sock, and mm-hmm. uh, you put your grain in there. And I pretty, I never reuse them. I use them once, tie it in a knot, uh, throw it in there, and then. When I'm done, I pull that thing out and you know throw it in the trash or, or dump it out in the garden and throw the bag away. Um, they're really not very reusable. Although I do have customers that that reuse them and <laughs> and uh, just but that's you know you do what you want you know. <laughs> they're only I think they're you know worth 15 cents or a quart or something like that, so they're pretty cheap. <laughs> I would just re- I would just uh, get a new one each time. But. Is there anything else on your list that is a must have. Hmm, let me see. Oh. The uh basic brewing DVD. Yeah. <laughs> um you probably Thank, pro- you. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you probably are gonna need uh some brushes. So oh, yes. um, you yes. know, whether it's yes. bottle brushes or carboy brushes. The phone <laughs> rings again. Another customer. Uh you pretty much Need to get uh, a, a selection of brushes, and I actually I would say uh, you probably ought to get uh, a small small brush for bottles. Uh, you'll need a carboy brush if you're going to use glass carboys, but I also suggest getting a small brush for cleaning out fermentation locks and other things. Uh, it's just mm-hmm. a very small, about one inch long. Um, you know, the the head on it's only about one inch long. It's about four or five inches long. But it's good for getting in the little nooks and crannies, uh, you know, valves and stuff like that. Um, but brushes, definitely a must-have. Now, we've, we've gone through, uh, we've taken quite a bit of time. So what we may want to do is do another segment. If you'd like, James, whatever you'd like. Well, I, I would like that. Okay. So maybe we can freshen up our beer and uh, go to... The Sounds next part. So th- thanks, Andy, for coming on this week. We'll see no. you next week here in no a couple problem. minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again to Andy and his dad, Neil, who was watching the front of the shop while Andy and I were sipping home brews and chatting leisurely in the back. Uh, if you want to visit Andy and Neil's store online, go to thehomebrewery.com. That's thehomebrewery.com. Well, next week, Andy and I continue our chat about gear and take it up a notch. What's not absolutely necessary but darned handy to have as far as homebrew equipment goes? Also, we'll take a peek at a couple of items that go even beyond that level of beer geekiness. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from, and help me out if you uh, uh, have either the name of the town or your name that you think I might uh, screw up on, because, you know, it's likely that I I would. (laughs) And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop, where you can find new pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In our first uh, DVD, Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online from us. And I'll pack it up for you. Moan darn self. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. (laughs) 